Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix, live in Davos. Now, here's what's coming up on today's program. Inflation expectations dropped to the lowest levels in nearly two years. The vice chair of BlackRock, Phil Hildebrand, tells us the U.S. and Europe are still heading for recession. Top EU and U.K. negotiators speak today to gauge whether a fix to the post-Brexit trading arrangements for Northern Ireland is within reach. And the World Economic Forum is back to its winter alpine setting here in Davos after two years of pandemic disruption. So don't miss our live interviews all week, including more from our interview with the chief executive of the Qatar Investment Authority. So coming up this hour, we'll have not only the QIA, but we'll get you interviews with top bankers. In just a moment, we'll also speak to BlackRock Vice Chair Philip Hildebrand. But first, let's check in on the markets with Danny Berger. Danny, it's all about currencies today. And good morning. It Good morning to you, friend. It is all about currencies for us who are uh, in front of a uh, Bloomberg terminal in a warm office, not out there in the Alps. But yes, we have seen the yen give back the gains that we saw this morning. That's a third asset I have on that board for you. The dollar is stronger. But before, it was all about JGBs breaching that half a percent ceiling that the BOJ had set. Will they change that again come Wednesday? But elsewhere, there is some decent risk appetite. Again, it is starting to fade. We had the best start to the year for European equities uh, in on record. Really, the idea that nat gas is lower, China's reopening. So we are having a reassessment of the global economy. But Bitcoin, Francine, that has fallen back below 21,000. It was up more than 1%. Meanwhile, iron ore tumbling in today's session with China warning uh, about false information in the market, saying they're going to crack down more. That has dented sentiment, Francine. Danny, thank you so much. Now we're joined here in Davos by the BlackRock Vice Chair, Philip Hildebrand. Philip, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Really, you're a Davos veteran. I know we have to go through uh, the note that you put out, but what's the mood like? I don't know whether there's always a counter mood if your people are too optimistic. It's bad news for the world economy. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. It's good to see the world coming back to Switzerland and reopening. That's very good news. Uh, look, I think people are still shaped by a very difficult year. So I think there might be a risk that we get into a kind of excessive pessimism, yep. judging by what we've all been through. Uh, there are lots of reasons to be worried, but I think there are also many opportunities. So we'll see how it settles in. So do you think inflation has peaked? Oh, very much so. I think inflation is going to drop very, very quickly. Uh, in fact, I, I believe many of us will be surprised how quickly it will fall. The problem is it will fall very quickly. So the nine to four will be the easy part. And then it's going to get very difficult to get inflation back to price stability. So uh, but at the moment, I think the initial phase will be a very rapid decline in inflation. So what does it mean for central banks, Philip? And you lay this out beautifully, actually, in your world outlook. If you're a central bank, if you're like the ECB or even if you're the Fed, do you have to be much more careful in how you manage this from now until the summer? I think the, the central banks are going to continue uh, on their tightening path. They're going to be very careful, very focused on not losing the long term inflation expectation anchor. Uh, and so I think we're going to see, you know, I, I don't see any chances, frankly, of easing this year. I think the market has that wrong. Uh, so they're going to make sure that we can really not just get from nine to four, but also limit any kind of uh, risks that inflation expectations become unanchored. And because all of this is driven by labor market constraints, principally, it's still a supply side story. It's going to be very difficult to get inflation kind of below 4 percent, let alone below below 3 percent. So we're in the but, easy phase, in a sense, now of this right. tightening cycle. But is there a problem with that markets don't understand <clears throat> that? So we have, for example, Fed officials saying, look, don't expect a, a Fed pivot anytime soon. But the markets keep on testing it. That's right. And, and you know, I think this this notion that there could be easing this year seems to be a uh, to me to be far too optimistic because if you're the central bank you're going to want to make sure that you can get this done mm -hmm. that you don't risk uh, resurging suddenly of inflation expectations further down the road so i think uh, we're going to see at best some sort of pause uh, but not quite yet and the market may need some readjusting relative to these expectations that we could be we could be seeing some easing uh, and this is this is what you know, we call the new it's a new regime the great moderation is over you know this notion that when the economy struggles central banks will ease that was true in the past i don't think it's going to be true this time and yet it's quite incredible to see actually the, the leverage being taken or for companies that are leveraged and interest rates going from 0 or 1% to where we are now without more bankruptcies are you expecting zombie companies companies to crop up? 
I think it all depends how much damage will have to be inflicted on the real economy to get this this last phase of the inflation being squeezed out from let's say four back to two percent. Uh, and, and, you know, that will be the big trade-off. So this will not come without cost. Uh, I, I do suspect at some point the central banks will kind of back off yeah. um, and not drive inflation all the way back to 2%. That might be a moment when the market can recalibrate. But for now, I see the tightening process continuing to ensure that we just we don't just go from nine to four, but can actually continue to bring inflation back under control. So when's crunch time? I mean, if we try to put inflation four to two percent, does that coincide with the beginning of the, the summer months or could it be later into the year? I think it, we're going to see very quickly kind of dropping to four. That's going to be, in a sense, the easy part. And then the question will become second, second half of the year, mid-year. What do the central banks do at that point? Do they continue and tighten far beyond what is currently expected in order to drive inflation back to 2%? I think that would entail uh, pretty significant recessionary yeah. tendencies in the real economy, a lot of damage to the real economy. Or do they at that point say, OK, we've done enough. So let's see what happens if we, if we let inflation persist uh, for a bit above the 2% target. So what does this mean for, for markets overall? More well, yeah, Volatility I think or pain? In, so there, there will be opportunities, you know, not least in, in, in credit, in short-term bonds. We now have a very different outlook again when you look at where interest rates are. So for long-term investors, many opportunities, I think, in that space. For equities, I suspect until we know what the central banks are going to do with that residual piece of the inflation adjustment from, let's say, 4 to back to 2%, uh, there are going to be some challenges around equity markets, you know, so some of the, the, uh, the enthusiasm right now with this notion that the central banks could ease again imminently, I suspect that's premature. So uh, I still see some volatility here going forward until we know how the central banks are going to handle this, this difficult trade-off that they face. But in November and maybe early December, the talk was all about the lack of liquidity in the markets and what that could do in terms of schisms or things going wrong. We don't really talk about that anymore. Yeah, the markets have, you know, if you think about what's happened in the, in the kind of Bitcoin space, uh, in, in many other areas, the market has actually adjusted reasonably well. Uh, the banking system uh, seems to be in pretty good shape relative, structurally relative to 2008. We don't see the excessive leverage in the system. So I think there is, you know, it's one of the, the positive aspects of the story here that we haven't seen kind of major disruption in, in, in the financial markets as a result of these tremendous adjustments. I mean, 2022 has been a year of amazing yeah. transition and adjustment. But could it just be delayed? It could be. Right. Uh, I think, again, it depends very much on, on how uh, damaging the recessions are going to be, which, it, again, in turn, will be a function of how aggressive will the central banks ultimately be to get inflation back to 2 percent. There's the COVID component, I guess, right? There's a lockdown component. Did, does that change consumer behavior? Because when we say inflation has peaked, but also consumer behavior has stayed strong, yeah. could we be looking at a distorted reality? I think what we're going to see, this is one of the reasons I, I, you know, I believe we're going to have uh, certainly in Europe, a mild recession, probably quite yeah. likely in the U.S. as well. The savings that have been accumulated and generated as a result of COVID, they're going to run off by the mid-year, yeah. by the summer. That's going to be exactly the time when the tightening that we've seen, this has been the most aggressive tightening cycle in history, basically, when that starts to kind of bite uh, in the real economy. So that's going to be a, a difficult moment mid-year when you have the savings effect fading yeah. and at the same time uh, the rate cycle, the increases in interest rates kind of feeding through the real economy. That's the test time. Philip, thank you so much. Philip Hildebrand there stays with us. Of course, he's from BlackRock. We'll talk a lot more also about maybe the banking system. Coming up, we'll bring you more from my earlier interview with the chief executive of one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. He's a guitar investment authority, chief executive. We talked about football, Elon Musk, Twitter, and much more. This is Bloomberg. Snow-covered Alps, private jets, and coveted white badges. The world's elite will descend on Davos for the World Economic Forum's first winter meeting since 2020.
The themes on the official agenda are a bit of a mouthful, so let's break it down. Here are the top three things that'll dominate this year's agenda. Number one, it's all about inflation. The post-COVID recovery crashed headfirst into surging CPI in 2022. Supply chains stretched to breaking point and prices soared, putting pressure on consumers. The Fed and central banks around the world responded with aggressive rate hikes, taking the possibility of a recession in their stride. But were they behind the curve? Number two, a shifting geopolitical landscape. Oh, yeah. Russia's invasion of Ukraine forced many nations to choose sides and shore up energy supplies. Russia was absent from the forum's summer gathering in May and won't be there this year either. China-US relations also hit a new low over Taiwan and human rights. China is looking to come back bigger than ever at its first gathering since the pandemic, but will they receive a warm welcome? Number three, crypto and regulation. A late addition to our top three, thanks to the implosion of Sam Bankman-Fried's FTX empire in November. His arrest and extradition to the US has given regulators more ammunition in their drive to rein in the crypto industry. So are we already past peak crypto? Those themes aside, the big question may be more about the event itself. With criticism in recent years about its relevance, can this year's Davos produce anything more than talk? Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in Davos. Now we're getting a little bit of breaking news. The German defense minister has requested, and this is a headline that Bloomberg wrote uh, just a couple of minutes ago, has requested to step down. Now there are a number of other media organizations also reporting more headlines, which we'll get to in a second as soon as we make sense of them. Some of them are a little bit cryptic. So we'll get to the bottom of it. The latest is uh, the defense minister has decided to step down, and this is after a series of gaffes, we understand, and missteps. Now, still with us here in Davos is the BlackRock Vice Chair, Philip Hildebrand. Philip, thank you so much for staying with us. We were talking a little bit before about inflation, the Fed, maybe some of the central bank divergence that we could see ahead. I mean, some of this divergence is going to be very nuanced. Who has the most difficult job right now? If you look at the ECB, the Bank of England, and we talk about the UK, but also the Fed and the Bank of Japan. I think probably the Bank of England, because it has, in a sense, the worst of both worlds. It has the, the labor market supply side constraints that, uh, that we see uh, elsewhere, and it also has the energy shock. So in a sense, you know, Europe has mostly the energy shock, the U.S. has mostly the supply side, the, the labor market constraints that are leading to these uh, wage pressures and tightness in the labor market. The, the Bank of England really is hit with both challenges yeah. at the same time. And, and you can see this in the fact that they've had to do the most. And uh, the, the trade-off, the cost of bringing inflation back under control will be the highest, in a sense, in, in the UK as a result of this constellation of being hit by both of these uh, forces at the same time. So is there anything that they can do to calibrate it? Because the Bank of England governor is also having a pretty tough time, I have to say, from all sides about, you know, being too slow, being too aggressive with interest rate hikes. Like, how does he do? Well, I think you have to be honest about it. And, and that's, you know, this is the new world. In the old world, the great moderation, you could get inflation under control and everything else would be fine. Now, bringing inflation back under control means you have to damage the real economy. It means you cause a recession. Yeah. And there's no way around this. This is why we are in a new regime, why investing has become more difficult. Uh, it's much more complicated. And I think the best thing the central banks can do, and, and more or less they all do this now, is to be open and, and acknowledge that bringing inflation back uh, under control, bringing price stability back into the game, entails um, essentially recessions. So w w think about it in this way. In the past, uh, central banks always came to the rescue to get you out of a recession. And now we have exactly the opposite. The central banks have to, in a sense, engineer recessions, or at least contracting economies, in order to get uh, inflation back under control. How do you see China opening or, or you know, opening with, with, I guess, great difficulty? We know we have also the vice president of China here, so there's only one G7 prime minister or president, and that's the German chancellor, and, but we do have the vice president of China. I think this week is important here because, remember, nobody has been to China in several years. There's been very limited interaction, even by telephone, by video. 
so to actually meet the Chinese leadership, the economic leadership at least here, will be a very important part of the financial industry, the corporate sector. From what we know from our office in China and elsewhere, the, the opening is happening in a very aggressive way. Yep. I think that should lead to more um, easing of the supply side constraints. So when I talked earlier about the rapid decline in inflation, that's certainly going to contribute to it. So there, there are definitely elements of very good news in yeah. terms of bringing inflation rapidly down from these very high levels at this point. And, and China, I think the reopening of China is a big part of it. How the COVID, the health dimension of this works out, yeah. I think is very difficult to judge from, from afar. Are you expecting a lot more, you know, a lot less regulation? What's your one question to the vice president when you meet him? I think the question, the main question today will be, where are they on the calibration between control and markets, in a sense, right? Um, and we've seen an extreme move towards control. And the question is, are we seeing some recalibration in order to get growth, in order to reopen, in order to help uh, address the world supply chain problems? So in a sense, this is an opportunity to get in, in a world that is fragmented now. Yeah. Geopolitically, we live in a very different world, great fragmentation, a lot of strategic competition, yeah. confrontation in some cases. Can we have the, uh, the, the Chinese leadership sort of be at least partly uh, in a cooperative stance again in the context of uh, helping uh, us get out of these uh, tremendous supply side constraints that we've seen as a result of, uh, of COVID and, and uh, the reopening? Philip, thank you so much, as always, for being with us. Philip Hildebrand there, the BlackRock vice chair. Now, coming up, closing in on a resolution. The EU and UK negotiators move towards a fix for their dispute over trading arrangements in Northern Ireland. We'll bring you that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in Davos. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News in London is Leanne Gerens. Hi Leanne. Hi Francine. Nepalese authorities say at least 68 people were killed when a Yeti Airlines flight crashed on Sunday. The twin engine ATR 72 per turboprop took off from Kathmandu and came down close to its destination of Pakora Airport. The aviation authority said the weather was clear and there was no distress call before the crash. 15 foreigners and at least 53 Nepalese were among those who were on board. Now China has announced almost 60,000 COVID deaths over the last five-week period, renewing calls for more information about the latest wave of infections. The WHO says it's analysing the data while urging Beijing to share more details, including on sub-variants. Several studies suggested the number of fatalities in China could be much higher than the official count. A Republican lawmaker has called on the White House to turn over visitor logs to President President Joe Biden's home in Delaware after classified documents were found at the residence. The move comes after the White House said on Saturday that lawyers had discovered more classified material than was previously announced. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, we're here in Davos. We haven't been here in the winter for about two to three years. It was pre-COVID. I remember one uh, pretty poignant interview, actually, with the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, when we asked for the first time about this virus called COVID. That was in 2020. And then since, the world economy has changed. So we're back in the Swiss Alps. And I have to say, uh, the main attraction is the fact that the Chinese delegation is back. Now, we are going to have meetings throughout the next couple of days. Will it all of them? 
no Russian or Chinese billionaire, though, are showing up. Olaf Scholz is actually the only G7 leader attending Davos here. Under agendas, the 53rd World Economic Forum is called Debating the Theme of Cooperation of a Fragmented World. Now, what this means is that we'll look at three main things. One is inflation and where the world economy is headed tomorrow. I'll have a number of panels, not only looking at the cost of living crisis, but looking at what the probability of a recession and what kind of recession we'll get. The other big question, of course, is not only on geopolitics, given that Russian, Russian oligarchs for many years were very present in Davos, but we'll try and understand, have a better and deeper understanding about what's going on, for example, with Ukraine. And the third question is, of course, about cryptocurrency. And giving you this was the big fallout in November. Uh, there is a least or a much less of a presence than just in May when we had the last World Economic Forum with, for example, Binance plastered in all of the promenade. We don't have that at the moment, but we'll try and speak to a lot of the uh, government officials, but also a lot of the bankers to see where they stand on crypto. Also, in the last uh, half an hour or so, the German defense minister, Christine Lambrecht, has resigned following days of speculation over her future. This is a blow to the Schultz government as it weighs crucial decisions over arming Ukraine. We'll have plenty more, of course, on that throughout the day. Join us here. It's just day one of the World Economic Forum. We have five more days ahead. This is Bloomberg. Inflation expectations dropped to the lowest level in nearly two years, but the vice chair of BlackRock, Philip Hildebrand, tells us the U.S. and Europe are still heading for a recession. Top EU and U.K. negotiators speak today to gauge whether a fix to the post-Brexit trading arrangements for Northern Ireland is within reach. And the World Economic Forum is back to its winter alpine setting in Davos after two years of pandemic disruption. Don't miss our live interviews all week, including more of our conversation with the chief executive officer of the Qatar Investment Authority. So good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Davos. The Qatar Investment Authority is one of the largest sovereign wealth funds. Well, our interview, our first interview here in Davos was with the QIA chief executive. Uh, we had a wide raging discussion, discussion where, amongst other things, we discussed investment in tech. Listen in. In the whole area of, uh, of technologies, we are interested. I mean, digitalization is a, a very important theme that we are taking. So we are investing in a s software application uh, that would play a role in the uh, digitalization. And again, uh, Francine, we are a long-term investor. Yes. So we always really uh, take a fundamental view yeah. into the sector and the theme that we are investing. Uh, any any correction in the market it doesn't mean that we need to really play the tactic uh, yeah. unless we would like to to close a gap in our portfolio but overall we are a long term investors and and we take a long term view what about banks i know in the past you've been very invested in banks it feels like it's almost a juncture because of higher interest rates for a lot of the banks uh, see, financial institution is a very important pillar in the, in the mix of the portfolio that we have in, in, in different markets. So ideally, in, in any exposure in any particular market, we would like to have a very uh, balanced uh, mix uh, in, the, in the portfolio, whether this is a technology or financial institution or real estate infrastructure. We always aim to have this balance. Uh, so investing in a financial institution will always be uh, a theme for us. Yes. Uh, but we're also moving to uh, a fintech, uh, a digital uh, financial institution, which is becoming very popular and, and, and a very important theme in our investment. But this would be what, um, in, you know, something only, mobile banking online only, or a big company with a big presence online? It could be, it could be only online uh, banking only, or an insurance, for example. Uh, so uh, so it could be anything. This is a very important. And again, it's yep. 
uh, line up with our important theme, with, which is digitalization, is becoming very important and uh, for the for the humankind. Yeah, how how, do, how much do you like football? I know there's speculation on, on the back of the World Cup, yes. probably unrelated. Yes. That uh, you know the QIA is also interested in buying a, a big stake, a sizable stake in one of the big UK football. See, I will be I will be. Uh, too general here. Uh, I mean, football, the clubs, and the sport is becoming uh, very commercialized uh, in a way. Especially uh, now, fans are uh, looking into this as an experience. So they would like to go and experience uh, uh, and entertain uh, themselves. At the same time, digitalization is becoming very important for this. So the business model of these institutions, let's say, are becoming very commercialized and very investment friendly. So you see even funds are becoming an investors in this. And uh, sovereign wealth funds are becoming also investors in some of the club. And uh, you will not be surprised if we invest this, but again, we go into a very fundamental uh, process and making sure that if we invest, this is a very commercially driven for our future generation. But would this be chosen actually on, on paper? I mean, we know that Man U is maybe up for sale. We know that uh, the Spurs are looking maybe to, to be sold as well or have a stake. Is this a stake? Would you buy a whole club? And if, if there are two equal ones, how do you choose? Uh, it's Again, it's a process that we go through. Uh, it's a discussion that we engage with the management. Uh, we have not, uh, we have not made our mind uh, yet. Okay. But, uh, but you know, this is a very commercially driven decision that we go through. Yeah. And again, sport is becoming very important theme as well. Uh, people are are engaged more in a sport, and digitalization is me making it more more attractive to investors as well. And so, do you see the Premier League changing in general, just because it's so much more attractive? And we're seeing so many also American funds getting in. Absolutely, it's uh, it's league is becoming also an, uh, another aspect, which is also uh, I saw a lot of investors are investing in a league, sport league as well. So, uh, you know, this is, I think, uh, a theme that uh, you will see it very active uh, in the coming uh, years as well. Is there anything else that we should be looking for? I don't know whether you're invested in crypto or some of the big themes. I mean, you're going after, you know, things that people love. So this is, you know, trophy assets. It could be football. It's technology. Twitter, certainly everyone's talking about it. Is there something else that you want to be in? See, crypto, we all, uh, had, you know, it is the same view that we had before. We are not interested in the cryptocurrencies, but we are interested in the blockchain. So any application that uh, using a blockchain would be of our interest. Uh, this is a technology that came to remain. Uh, sustainability is another theme yeah. that we are interested in. And this is also a theme that came to stay for a long time. And we would like to play a role in the transition that uh, the globe is, is, is going through. And we are investing in all aspects, whether this is in the technology that play a role in the sustainability or in the infrastructure renewables. Uh, the latest investment that we had, for example, with RWE, a yeah. German company that that invest in the renewable, it ticked the box for, uh, for it ticked all the box for us. It's renewable. Yeah. It's a management that we like. It's an expansion in the U.S. market. So this is a very important theme as well that we will continue seeing us very active. What's the ultimate trophy? Actually, is there is there one thing that you know, if it came up at the right price, you would you would absolutely no doubt try and buy? Uh, I don't have a name in my <laughs> mind, but definitely, again, if this is makes sense commercially, we will we will invest again. Being having a trophy assets, it's not yeah. really a theme uh, okay. that we. It's always about how fundamentally makes sense for the future generation. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that we, we manage the fund for them. Well, that was my interview with the chief executive of the Qatar Investment Authority, Mansour Ibrahim Al Mahmoud. So we'll have plenty more coming up. Coming up, the former Prime Minister of Finland, Alex Stubb, he joins us right here in Davos. We'll talk about German politics, we'll talk about Ukraine, and of course, geopolitics as well. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Davos. Now, the German Defense Minister, Christine Lambrecht, has resigned following days of speculation over her future in a blow to Chancellor Olaf Scholz's government. Uh, we're joined now by the former Prime Minister of Finland, uh, Director at the European University Institute for International Governance, he's Alexander Stubb. So thank you, as always, for joining us. Look, you're an expert in geopolitics. I know you've been following, of course, not only the fragmentation of the world, but possibly the holding of the alliance in the West and what happens with Ukraine. We had that breaking news about half an hour ago about the German defense minister resigning after a series of errors. What does it mean going into, you know, still you're in the winter months, you have to negotiate on Ukraine, you're talking to Putin and you lose your defense minister? Well, I think the system actually keeps afloat, which basically means that you have a very strong civil service, you have a very strong government that is able to give some continuation uh, for the system. I mean, remember that the former a defense minister of Germany is now the president of the European Commission. Uh, and actually the Finnish uh, defense minister at the moment is on paternity leave. So, you know, the system keeps you afloat, so I wouldn't be that worried about it. When you look at Ukraine and everything that's happening right now, can you put us in, in the geopolitical context? It seems we worry about it less, but there's still a war. It's still at the, really, the, the footsteps of Europe. Should we worry about it more? Well, I think it's very important that we continue to discuss it. And the way in which I see it, that this conflict is not about Russia versus the West. It is as much about the West versus the rest. So we're seeing this disruption in global politics and in geopolitics, a, a world which has essentially been dominated by the West since 1945 and certainly during the post-Cold War era. And I think that's a lot of the conversation that we're going to have here in Davos is how do we get the challengers involved? Right. And, and actually, it's one country that can really make or break or can certainly make the difference, and that's China. And they're here in Davos. We haven't really heard from them in the last three years because of of strict lockdowns. What are you expecting from the Chinese? Well, Chinese presence here is actually quite limited. Uh, from what I gather, roughly 60 delegates around uh, the vice premier. We remember when Donald Trump had been elected and then in 2017 President Xi Jinping was here, sort of the big globalizer, if you will. What we're seeing now is actually more presence from India, which is interesting to see. And of course, India is set to pass China in terms of population this year. So there is this sort of creation of a few power centers. One is the West, in other words, the United States, the European Union. One is China and then probably India somewhere in between. So it's really interesting times for us international relations buffs. So uh, globalization is now, you know, a dirty word in many parts of the world. Should yeah. we call it something else? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, I still think that globalization has benefited, of course, mankind by and large. It's lifted uh, millions and millions of people uh, out of poverty. But at the same time, it is about equal distribution, but it's also about equal representation. So I think a lot of non-Western countries feel that they are not really present, represented in international institutions. That's why there's a lot of challenge on the multilateral system, on the WTO and the World Bank and the IMF. You know, people want to have a say, but I wouldn't be excessively worried about this is the pendulum of global politics. And I actually think we're not entering an era of deglobalization, but probably a regionalization of globalization. So what does that mean in terms of defense, but also the economy? It probably means that we're starting to see more protectionist right. uh, activity. And we saw that with the United States, with the CHIPS Act and the IRA, and perhaps some retaliation coming from the European Union, which I hope we won't do. So I think a lot of people got afraid that the value chains used to be global. Then came COVID. There was Donald Trump uh, and and of course now came the war in in in, in Ukraine and Russian uh, aggression now people start to think what well, listen should I try to produce stuff at home how should I protect my economy it's a really careful balance I myself am a free trader so anytime we talk about strategic autonomy uh, I'm always afraid that it's going to lead to protectionism but it, it, it is a little bit of a balance I hope that we keep, yeah. keep things open so I guess a lot of countries have also found themselves very vulnerable because of the supply chain issues D does that change to supply chain I mean if they change they take three four years so is it worth it uh, there are going to be some changes. So the sort of Ricardo thinking that you produce where it's most beneficial is probably not going to work. So you're going to find some industrial policy where you start protecting your sort of strategic economy, uh, if you will. But it's very, you know, as we've seen with the United States and the IRA, I think the intention is good. And, you know, the, the Biden administration says that this is going to, uh, you know, help the green transition. But it's, it's, it's a very careful balance because if we start going tit-for-tat protectionism, that's bad 
bad for the global economy, and when it's bad for the global economy, it's bad for the local economy as well. How do you say you, you, Ukraine ending? So when you look at NATO and the fact that even two, three years ago, we thought that maybe this was something that was, um, I guess, old and obsolete w would be a way of putting it. Certainly it was the U.S. view. Now it's back. Yeah, definitely. I, I think what happened was that, you know, Putin mixed strategy and tactics. Everything that he wanted went exactly the opposite way. So he got a European Ukraine, uh, he got a united European Union, he got a rejuvenated transatlantic partnership, and he got a NATO with a new purpose, sort of back to 1948, 1949, as a repellent then to the Soviet Union. And of course, the icing on the cake is that my country, Finland, and Sweden are going to join NATO. So in many ways, NATO is back. But NATO's back to how much does that aggravate Putin? I mean, when we talk about threats of nuclear war, should we take it seriously? Of course you have to take it seriously, but I still think uh, that the step in that direction is, is simply too far. We should also remember that Putin threatens with nuclear weapons. And if we backtrack, that means that he's going to do it again. You see, I was involved in mediating peace in the war in Georgia. Yeah. And he thought, ah, this was easy. I got what I wanted. I was prime minister when Putin took over Crimea. He thought, ah, this was easy. I got what I wanted. So now, if we were to give in, he would think that it's easy going. I think the big thanks in all of this goes to Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. They are the ones who have fought back. If Putin had been able to walk into Kiev in three days, as many of us expected, then I think the West would look much, much weaker than it does right now. So could we have done differently to change the course of humanity, I guess? Is there, is there a, a critical point where the West could have reacted and should have reacted differently to Putin? With the wisdom of hindsight, a lot of us believed that interdependence and integration would lead to such relationships that war becomes impossible. I mean, that was the basic philosophy of the European Union, right? That's why we do trade. We, we become dependent. We didn't know that Putin was what he was. Uh, so with hindsight, I guess we could have been tougher after Georgia. Um, I guess we could have been tougher after Crimea, but there's no use crying over spilt milk. Now we just have to go all the way and basically push Russia and Putin out of Ukraine and hopefully at the end of the day come with a regime change. Well, what are you most looking forward to in Davos? So it's changed a lot. I mean, we've been covering it for a number of years, less people, more people, uh, different, of course, industries that want to show up. A lot of Wall Street is showing up, but doesn't necessarily want to be an world stage. Yeah, I mean, I, I always look forward to this. This is, I think, my eighth or ninth time. So you sort of, it, it's a bit sort of, you know, globalization or uh, international relations on steroids. Okay, okay. Uh, and I, I hope to, look, I'm writing a book actually on the new age of disorder and how competition, conflict and cooperation is shaping the 21st century. And I want to get some new ideas for that because I firmly believe that we need to move towards a more dignified foreign policy. It's not going to be a Western ruled world anymore. And it's a question of how we get cooperation going again. Alexander, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Alexander Stubb there, a director of the European University Institute School of Transnational Governance and, of course, former prime minister. Let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Ineos says to buy assets being sold by Switzerland's seeker to appease antitrust regulators after the takeover of German rival MBCC Group. Sources say the purchase by Ineos values assets at $750 million. Seeker's admixture business makes substances that can be added to concrete to modify its properties. Less than £400 million of offices were bought and sold in London and the final months of last year. That's an 88% drop from the third quarter and a 20-year low. The deal-making freeze came as former Prime Minister Liz Truss's proposals for unfunded tax cuts did spook the markets. Now, Credit Suisse is reported to be gearing up to cut more than 10,000% of its European investment bankers this year. According to the Financial Times, the reductions at the Swiss lender comes after an earlier announcement of 9,000 job losses by 2025. Credit Suisse is expected to report its second consecutive annual loss, and that is next month. And Apple's manufacturing partners, Foxconn and Pegatron, have included Southeast Asia in their expansion plans for this year. Both companies are adding more production capacity outside of China after they encountered serious COVID-related disruptions, and that was last year. Violent protests at Foxconn plant forced Apple to cut its forecast and output was also halted. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine.
Leon, thank you so much. Coming up, Germany's defense minister, Sepp Stan, will head to Berlin for the latest developments on that. And this is Bloomberg. Tuesday, a Bloomberg exclusive live from Berlin, where German Chancellor Olaf Scholz sits down with Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. A wide-ranging conversation only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Davos. I don't know whether you can hear the tuba. I'll make you listen to it. This is what happens in Davos. Sometimes you get serenaded uh, actually by someone. This is not official music. This is just possibly someone who lives in the village who wanted to welcome the participants as they come in into the Congress Center. We're day one. We'll have five more days of this. Now, the German Defense Minister, Christine Lambrecht, has resigned this morning after days of speculation. For more on all of this, we're joined by Arne Delfs, our Bloomberg government reporter who's live from Berlin. So, Arne, this has been going for a couple of days. Why has she finally resigned? resigned. Yes, uh, hi, hi there. Um, she had really bad coverage, media coverage, the last uh, few months, actually. She, she made some gaffes. She was never really seen as connecting to the army. So in a way, many people are, especially in the army itself, are relieved uh, that she's finally resigning. OK, wh what does this mean for Chancellor Olaf Scholz? Well. He doesn't look very good in this, I must say. I mean, he for for months he has uh, basically stuck to her. She, he, he didn't want to drop her. Now suddenly comes this decision, and people wonder why now because it's a really bad timing. We have the Rammstein meeting coming up. Actually, U.S. Defense Minister Austin is coming over here on Thursday, and nobody knows actually whom he will meet. It's an odd uh, situation. It is an odd situation. Or do you have any names of who could step up and become defense minister? I mean, I can't. It can't take very long to appoint someone. No, no, it must go quick. And uh, there are names indeed. There is like the SPD co-leader, party leader Lars Klingbeil, who's a strong candidate. The problem is there is kind of this gender balance in the cabinet, which has to be uh, kept. So it maybe it. It needs to be a woman again. Then Eva Högel, she is a military expert from the Social Democratic Party. There are a number of names uh, circling around, but I would I would opt for Eva Högel right now. I must say, yeah. All right. Who's an Arne, experienced? So much. Uh, who's an experienced? Sorry, <laughs> who's an experienced no, military you? expert? Arne, thank you. Arne Delfs there, Bloomberg government reporter. Now, we'll continue our coverage out of Davos. Stay tuned for our interview with the Saudi Minister of Planning and Economy, his Faisal Al-Brahim. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York, Anna Edwards in London, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.